Just a heads up, this episode contains mentions of sex and sexual assault, and some language that might not be suitable for everyone. I'm not immune to love. I'm just, I don't seek it out. Mm. I am worried this is going to mess up my algorithm. I hope they don't start showing me, like, romantic <laughs> <laughs> no, don't, don't mess up my algorithm with uh, this. Uh, you're going to be watching 27 no, Dresses. No, no, you're going to be watching The Holiday. Please do not recommend me no more yes. like this. You're listening to It's Been a Minute from NPR. I'm Brittany Luce. And today, in this most merry of episodes, I'm joined by none other than one of the hosts of Weekend Edition and a returning friend of the show, Aisha Roscoe. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. How are you? I'm good. I'm so excited that you are here today for this because this is unfinished business. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Aisha first came on the show back in October. And after we had her on, we asked her to embark on a journey of discovery for us because she'd been sitting out on a big cultural phenomenon. So in the very first episode that I hosted, of this show. There was a big reveal. And the big reveal was that <laughs> you had never seen Love Actually. Extremely popular Christmas movie that came out yes. nearly 20 years ago. But <laughs> things have changed. Yes, things have changed. I had never seen this movie. I had heard talk of it. I kind of walked in on parts of it. And I was like, what is this crap? And, <laughs> <laughs> and was like, uh, but I have watched it now. Now, for those of you who also somehow haven't seen Love Actually, or who maybe need a refresher, it's a romantic comedy set in London that follows nine interconnected stories all about the complexities of love, from childhood crushes to unrequited passion to infidelities to love at first sight. And it's kind of a who's who of British stars. Hugh Grant, Colin Firth, Emma Thompson, Liam Neeson, Keira Knightley, Bill Nye, the list goes on. Finally, and this is the reason we're talking about it now, it takes place during Christmas. Okay, let's recap what was said when you were on the show last. We can just play a little moment. <laughs> the type of movies I like to watch, they usually involve murder or a supernatural <laughs> killer or um, the UK prime minister running from a zombie. Uh -huh. I, I have not seen Love, actually. What? You haven't seen Love, actually? I don't okay. like love. I, this is something people don't know about me. I do not Aisha, like love movies. That's not really what the movie is about. It's about <laughs> Christmas. <laughs> Well, I believe I believe in love personally, but I don't like to see it. It's like, oh, romantic comedies. Oh, they're falling in oh love. Who cares? God. Where is the killing? So, yes, that's how I felt. That's how I felt. <laughs> that's how I feel. <laughs> <laughs> so the movie didn't shift any needles for you. <laughs> On today's show, Aisha's take on Love Actually, plus what the holiday movie genre gives that other films don't. After this quick break. Okay, okay, okay. Now that we have covered your, your past feelings, yes. you know, in the B-L-A, before <laughs> Love Actually. <laughs> yes. Now we're in a new era. What's your overall reaction now that you've seen it? Okay. It was too long. <laughs> <laughs> it is over two Let's hours. Start. Let's start with that. The runtime is lengthy. Why is it so many people? <laughs> <laughs> like, why do we care about all these people? We could have cut a few characters. We, we need to do Love Actually, Aisha's <laughs> Cut. That's what we need. You know, I I did see Liam Neeson, and he wasn't mm. going after any kidnappers, and I felt like oh, that was I feel a waste. Like that was a disappointment for you. It was a disappointment. It was a disappointment, <laughs> and of course, I saw the guy who played Rick in Walking Dead, and I realized Over Andrew oh, okay. Lincoln. Andrew Lincoln. There were no zombies, um, so I feel like he was underutilized as well. And I just felt like a lot of these people they didn't have they didn't have good boundaries. No. Okay. But I got it. I mean, I get why people like it, right? I felt like it leaned into the cheesiness, but I appreciate that mm. because I feel like if you're gonna do it, then do it. You know, put your whole put your back into it. You know what I'm saying? Put your whole <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. And I feel like it did that. 
I do wonder if part of the charm of it is, you know, the fact that it was like British mm. and like Americans are watching it and we just love those little accents. That is true. <laughs> and it, that is true. It made it very posh. <laughs> And there were parts where my heart was softened. I did okay. feel a little... Like, I had parts where my heart was softened. Okay. G- give me an example <laughs> of a part that, that softened your heart. I did like the little boy. He fell in love. Mm-hmm. And he said, love is agony. I'm a little relieved. Why? But because I thought it would be something worse. Worse than the total agony of being in love. I thought it was cute. Like, I thought those interactions were cute. I think longing for someone is like, I think that's a universal thing. The part that really softened my heart was the guy who was his brother, slept with his wife. Oh, Colin Firth, his character, Jamie. Colin right, right, Firth, right. Jamie, when he proposed to the Portuguese lady and in his bad Portuguese and you're reading the subtitles. Claro que eu pensar que tu dizes na. Mas é Natal é só queria saber. It touched my little heart. Oh. It touched my heart. Yes. This being my answer. <laughs> I felt a little like oh, like a little this is, even though it was crazy, it made no sense. It made zero right. sense. It was just like, oh, that is. Because they just, because literally they had a language barrier. He could only have known for her for about, what, a month? He didn't know her at all. She was cleaning his rental home. Yeah. They had maybe had 30 minutes of conversation total, probably. But not really. I mean, because they didn't speak the same language, but they were in love somehow. Like, that's the thing about this movie. <laughs> Everybody's in love just like you look at the person. I love you. <laughs> You're the love of my life. What? You know, one of the things that has come up um, as we were discussing the film as a group, like the, the film really is told through a white male gaze, which I mean. Oh, yes. Yeah, that's 150% yeah, yeah. true. <laughs> yes. With the prime minister, it was like, okay, so he falls in love with Natalie, mm-hmm. who was, I guess she was like the caterer, but then it seemed like she was delivering official documents. But then it right. was- <laughs> I rewatched it earlier. When they're introducing her, they're like, this is Natalie. Didn't explain what her job was. But all she did was serve him. She served she him served all of his him meals. And she gave him, him papers. Right. For, for other people like Aisha of the past who haven't seen the film, there is a key point. Uh, the President of the United States is visiting the Prime Minister, played by Hugh Grant, of the UK. And they're supposed to have like some general diplomacy meeting. We don't even really know what they're talking about. The details mm-mm, are not mm-mm. important at all. And <laughs> the President of the United States, played by Billy Bob Thornton, has some very untoward behavior and gets mm-hmm. in the personal body buffer zone mm-hmm. of Miss Natalie, the woman that uh, the Prime Minister has taken a little shine to. Mm -hmm. Uh, Natalie, I hope to see much more of you as our two great countries work toward a better future. Thank you, sir. And he gives this speech to the British press saying how, like, we no longer have a special relationship with the United States. I fear that this has become a bad relationship. Yeah, this is what Hugh Grant says. We're a strong country, even though we're we're not as powerful. We are still a mighty. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we may be a small country, but we're a great one too. The country of Shakespeare, Churchill, the Beatles, Sean Connery, Harry Potter. And it was like the, the, because we didn't know what the conflict was or what they were meeting about, <laughs> like diplomacy wise. The speech is really him being like, "You're not going to mess with my woman." Yes. And since bullies only respond to strength, from now onward. I will be prepared to be much stronger. And the president should be prepared for that. Uh, That was sexual assault. That was not right. But, um, you know, I felt like we were going to to war with Britain. We we no longer have a special relationship. That's 200 years. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so I had an issue with that. And even Andrew Lincoln, who was kind of creepy with his friend's uh, wife. We haven't gotten to that. Yeah. Right. Who was played by... Kira Knightley, when she was like 18, 17 years old. Oh, wow. She did look yeah. young. But you never talk to me. You don't like me. It's a self-preservation thing, you see. 
I mean, I was glad to find out about the cards thing, but the famous thing where he's standing outside holding the cards outside the door. But now seeing it, it's like, so what were they? What was supposed to happen with this? With he just in love with his friend's wife, and but he never talks to her. So how's he? In love? You know, it's, right. Right, like all they talked about the whole movie, he hates her. He's avoiding her. Yes. He don't want to be bothered with her. And then he shows up to their house and has all these cue, ca- <laughs> cue cards. <laughs> cue cards. And he's telling her, I love you so much. Playing this. Yes. It's weird. And it was creepy because like, why would you take pictures of her at the wedding and only just zoom in on her face? That's weird. That's creepy. It's weird. And when you talk about the white male gaze, he says she's like practically perfect or whatever. She's perfect, but you don't talk to her. You don't deal with her. That's that's part of the issue. She's mm. a perfect figure that mm. you can look at and not hear from, right? Like the perfect woman is that woman that you stare mm. at but does not interact with you. Mm. It's, <laughs> you it's, it's, very, it's very problematic. Yes. That's not what love is. Love is not staring in the eyes of somebody <laughs> wistfully. Love is like doing the laundry, but you can't make no movie about that. So I get it. I get it. But that's <laughs> that was part of my issue. Yeah. You know, I, I never watched it thinking like, yeah, this is what relationships are supposed to be like. However, <laughs> no. the older I get, there is like a big theme in the film of like male boss female mm-hmm. employees yes. like Hugh Grant prime minister with yes. Natalie Natalie yes. with no real job title it's like the perfect woman she's bringing you biscuits she's bringing your mail <laughs> and then the one with Colin Firth who she right. she was cleaning the house so she was working for him and at one point he loses a manuscript in the pond behind yes. his house and she strips down to her underwear and, and, and jumps in there and cold and so, water and in the cold water oh god she's in Right, and now she'll think I'm a total spaz if I don't go in too. And I should say, my husband did see parts of this because I was watching this in multiple places because, like I said, I got a lot going on. My husband watched that part of it and he was like, oh, you would never jump in the water for me. And I was like, "Uh, no, I I sure wouldn't. (laughs) And that's why it's a movie. That's why it's a movie. movie. And even Alan Rickman, the the boss guy who has this executive assistant who's hitting on Alan Rickman all the time and eventually... He's hitting back. You know yes. what I'm saying? Yeah, he's into yeah, it. He's catching yeah. He's catching the affection. He likes it. It's inappropriate. It's inappropriate. It's inappropriate. Yes. But I have to say, Emma Thompson as Alan Rickman's wife, her performance is so good. Imagine your husband bought a gold necklace and come Christmas gave it to somebody else. She was good. She did a great job. I am so in the room. A classic fool. Yes, but you Fools are made a fool out of me. We've made the life I lead foolish too. And she still shows up to the kids' Christmas pageant. Now, I will say, if that had been me, I would have been blowing off the children's Christmas pageant. I wouldn't even have been Oh, there. I would have. Like, it would have been... Yelling, screaming. I yelling, screaming. Like, as soon scene. as I realized, like, let me call my mama to take the kids to this thing. Cause it's- <laughs> exactly. Because <laughs> I'm about to set it off. <laughs> Literally, same. I was like, again, that must be that Britishness because I was like, someone like me? Uh Uh-uh. First of all, I'm going to be like, so who you buy the necklace for? Did you buy it for that hoe at the office? Oh, and then... then (laughs) That's going to go on the podcast. No, I could not have held it in to go to the children's thing. I wish I could be that together as a mother, but I just would have been like, kids... I need y'all to go to the other room. (laughs) (laughs) Also, they also kept saying, going back to Natalie for a second, did you pick up on the fact that they kept calling her fat the whole movie? Oh, yeah. That was my other issue. Like, why are they fat shaming Natalie? This is my direct question (laughs) on my book right here. It was insane. It didn't make any sense. I couldn't see it. It's like the fact that they it was so fat phobic in general. My goodness. And then on top of that, the film is... Not diverse. And that didn't necessarily surprise me for like no, a mainstream no. 
Christmas romantic comedy in 2003. 2022. However, (laughs) you know, there's very few characters of color in this film, despite being set Mm. in one of the most diverse cities, you know, in in the UK, I imagine. Mm -hmm. Um, And most of the characters of color who do show up are kind of in the typical role. The sidekick. uh, Mm -hmm. I couldn't tell whether this black woman was the the prime minister's chief of staff. They don't, they barely give anybody a job in this film. (laughs) Um, But the assistant, you know. And then at the very end, the young black woman who's the gifted performer. All I want for Christmas is you. It's interesting, now that I'm watching it, looking specifically and thinking about that. Yeah, it, it, it definitely hits different in 2022 because I feel like audiences have grown. I have grown to expect to, yes, more to expect from the films more. I see. Yeah. Next up, what Aisha really thinks about folks who love Love Actually and why even bad Christmas movies are still so good. So we've established that Love Actually has some problems. (laughs) Just a little bit. But still, it's one of the most popular and most beloved Christmas movies Mm -hmm. of the 2000s, perhaps all time. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to give you some stats right now to back this up. Okay. 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 When it came out in 2003, it grossed almost $200 million. It was nominated for a Golden Globe for Best Motion Picture, Musical, or Comedy. I mean, Love Actually is still showing in theaters in 2022. Yeah, when I looked it up and it was like showtimes and you could see like that it was at at movie theaters um, for people who want to see it. So there are plenty of writers who have been defending this film for years in in mm-hmm. like real serious publications of note. I mean, it's a big deal. And here, I, this is something I will say, even though I might sound a little grinchy throughout this, I don't believe in knocking what people love. I mm. think it's not great to be that person mm-hmm. who everybody's talking about, they love whoever, Taylor Swift. You come in and go like, I don't think she's that great. It's like- I'm that person. <laughs> Okay, didn't nobody ask you. Who cares what you think? We're we're mm. happy. Like I don't want to rain on people's parade. If you love love actually, that is great. That is great for you. You can love love actually. I support you in that. That is beautiful, <laughs> Aisha. You have, you know, hit, hit upon something. I mean, mm-hmm. love it or hate it, this film is a part of the yes. culture. It's officially mm-hmm. part of the Christmas canon. So, you know, even if one doesn't love the film it is loved mm. actually <laughs> i like how you did that it's i okay. like how you did that it's a it, teamwork makes the dream work over here <laughs> yes, okay this yes. it was a, it, that 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 line was a group effort so on the point of christmas when we first discussed this film months ago yes. i said it's not about romance it's about christmas, christmas. and it is you're right, extra it is actually about love well, and because- it is kind of about christmas well, I, I well i have thoughts about how christmasy the film is because that also was a point of contention within the team <laughs> where not everybody agreed on how Christmassy the film was or not. Do you feel like the film has much actual Christmas cheer? Like beyond the setting, is it really about Christmas, you think? I think it has a lot of Christmas cheer, right? The mm-hmm. Christmas parties, the Christmas performances, mm-hmm. and like the Christmas music. I do think it was weird the way they tried to say that Christmas is a time to like tell the truth. And I'm like, <laughs> what? It was basically like Christmas is a time to tell hard truths. And I'm like, is it? <laughs> it's like, it's Christmas is a time to hit on your best friend's wife. Is, is that the meaning of Christmas? <laughs> They didn't give me that one in Sunday school, actually, I I don't think. mm, I didn't know that was what baby Jesus was all about. You said, I need to tell you the truth because it's Christmas. I didn't know that Christmas was a time for hard, unsettling (laughs) truth. (laughs) But I do think there was a lot of Christmas. And I think the way that some of it is so, like, unbelievable, I think that's Christmas, right? Like, Mm. it's like, oh, the prime minister is coming to the neighborhood. And then the boy ran into the airport to see the little girl. His crush. and His crush. He's doing all these flips. Yeah, his flips. It was very unsafe in that airport. (laughs) Very unsafe. Joanna. Sam? I thought you didn't know my name. Of course I do. 
you know, that whole thing. Like, I felt like that feels like Christmas to me. Mm. Like, Christmas magic. That's what that felt like to me. Mm, Christmas magic. Yes. You know, some of the adoration and, and the criticism about love actually can be applied to the whole Christmas genre. And I kind of want to, I want to take a second to look at what makes the genre. So we have the Christmas romance film, uh, movies like The Holiday, The Perfect Holiday, mm. The Best Man Holiday, and of course, mm-hmm. Love Actually. But the Christmas film genre is so much bigger than those. Like we have Bad Mom's Christmas, Home Alone, um, The Last Holiday, The Family Stone. These films are markedly different than like the Christmas romance film, but they all hit some of the same marks. To your point, they give you that feeling of Christmas magic. Like everything yes. works out in the end in these films. Like yes. there's yeah. not really any stakes. No. There's also all these themes yeah. of home and family and bringing people together. It, I feel like those are the kind of things that I'm gravitating toward at the end of the year when it, at least where mm. I live, it's cold and I really need that winter break away from work. <laughs> yes. And I feel like these films are like exactly what I'm looking for in those moments. I can see that. I can see that. I think I can see how it's very comforting. They feel good. Mm-hmm. They're light. You don't have to think a whole lot. Mm-hmm. And it's not like a whole lot of sadness. And uh, Although some of them have sad parts. Mm-hmm. So I do get that. Now for me, like when I'm like, I just need to really get away I'm like, I want to watch something with like a satanic cult or something. <laughs> I want something like... That's your release. That's my release. Like, that's what I've been watching. Uh, I just need a break from work. It's just been too much. I can't even do reality TV too much. Mm. I'm like, I want to watch something scary, crazy, mm-hmm. you know, just out of this world. Like a Christmas slasher. Christmas, Christmas exorcism. slasher. Exorcism, demonic possession, mm-hmm. you know, like that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. You know, I had to cleanse my palate after love, actually. I'm like, let me watch Cabinet of Curiosities. <laughs> <laughs> Let me look at this killer painting. Okay. Ooh, that's crazy. So that's that's how I but I understand why people would watch Christmas movies. I get it. Mm-hmm. I get it. You know, yeah. um I so I love Christmas movies. I watch I watch the family mm-hmm. ones. I wa- I never miss a home alone every year. I it, <laughs> I'm watching all of the lifetime, you know, holiday films that they put out every year. I watch the ones on Netflix. Mm-hmm. I watch them on all the streamers. I'm yes. obsessed. Okay. Um mm-hmm. And I realized that, like, I have like, almost a different, like, matrix for deciding whether or not, like, those films are good. It's almost like what makes, like, a general, you know, film good is that there's narrative tension and you get all mm-hmm. caught up in the story and you don't know what's going to happen next. And I love those movies. But okay. when it comes to like Christmas films, especially Christmas romances, it's almost like I judge them by a different standard. It's like that lack of tension is okay. mm-hmm. is what makes it kind of satisfying for me in a way. It's like the best of Christmas film canon doesn't really apply to other types of movies. What do you think about that? Like the idea that we have like a different grading system almost when it comes to Christmas films as a genre. Well, I think because when you get into like something that's like really genre, right? Mm. Like it's you're looking for certain beats. And so the best movies may be those that just play up those like beats really well, <laughs> right? Like they may not have the best acting, but it's like, oh, that was a really great twist. Or I didn't see that coming. Right. They lean into the genre and then they give you something, maybe a little surprise here or there. Oh, I like how they did mm-hmm. that. That's what you're judging it more by than like, is it just like a great movie? That's what I think. Mm. It's like, because you have the comfort of, you kind of know exactly what's going to happen, right. kind of. But then they put a little spin on it and you go, oh, that was good. I didn't even know. And you don't expect much. That's the other thing. You <laughs> that don't have much expectation. True. That's true. Because you're like, That's I'm just true. watching. I'm going to watch this regardless. So if you clear the bar of just doing it like baseline good, you're like, okay, this is excellent. No, that's absolutely right. It's like, <laughs> I think what I'm looking for in these films and what many viewers are looking for is that feeling of Christmas magic. Like yes. believing yes. in Santa Claus and the, and like the idea that somebody is going to just bring you all these presents and you're going to have this amazing mm-hmm. morning, opening them all up. I don't know. It just creates this sense of wonder and possibility around the season that yeah. when you become an adult, <laughs> it's hard to access that. But You know, Mm -hmm. thinking about a film like Love Actually or, you know, all these Lifetime Christmas movies that I absolutely love, 
what gives you that sense of wonder and possibility as a grown up? But like, you know, maybe thinking about like maybe the person that I lock eyes with at the at the department store is the love of my yeah, life, or yeah. maybe yes, yeah, like <laughs> I, you know, I'll click my heels three times and I will be living in a mansion and all of my student yeah. debt will be paid. <laughs> um, I think that's a great observation. It's the magic, right? It's the there could be more to life, mm. right? Like there could be something magical and otherworldly and that more, mm. right, than just what we are bound <laughs> to. And you can get that freedom from, like, Christmas magic. You can also get it from dark magic, too. That's what I like. <laughs> <laughs> so you, can, you can get it from ghosts or you can get it from Father Christmas. You can get it from either one. But it's the idea that there's more that we don't understand, right? <laughs> <laughs> Aisha, thank you so much for giving me your film criticism today. I really appreciate it. I am always happy to do it. I'm always happy to talk about stuff. That's what I get paid to do. That's what my son says. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that was Aisha Roscoe, co-host of NPR's Weekend Edition. This episode of It's Been a Minute was produced by Jessica Mendoza, Corey Antonio Rose, it was edited by Jessica Placek. Engineering support came from Carly Strange. Jay says, Thanks for listening, y'all. I'm Brittany Luce. Till next time, talk soon. <laughs>